So let me get us started and say to people to make sure if you haven't yet had a chance to get up and get a copy or you to please do that. I'm sure Jeff won't mind it. If you're on this side, you can always go out and around and come in on this side so you don't um, feel like you have to walk across the front of the room. I'm Kim Brooks, the Dean here at the Schulich School of Law. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to tonight's mini law lecture series. If you haven't been here in one of these series before and this is your first time, a special uh, welcome. We do these on a sort of slightly irregular schedule, but every couple of weeks to every month. And so um, there's a roster of them, and uh, there's some forms at the back that you can grab if you think this is interesting and want to find yourself here again. Let me introduce you to my colleague, Jeff Loomer. You are in for a real treat tonight. First of all, Jeff knows something about tax, which is, in my view, about as interesting as it gets. So, um, so you'll enjoy him. He is one of the smartest people I know. He's modest, thoughtful, considerate. Um, he's kind of unassuming, I mean all these things you wouldn't expect to see in a tax lawyer maybe. Uh, he's enormously well liked by his students who take his classes in droves, even into corporate tax and international tax in the every year, and he's won teaching awards here. He does research in all areas of tax law, he does a bit of work in the secure transactions area. He's an expert in this particular area and is widely sought by the media to comment on things. If you are here to get advice about how to avoid your international uh, obligations, he is not the man for you, so I'm sorry about that in advance. But I have no doubt that you will enjoy tonight's talk. Please press him with questions at the end and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for that uh, outrageous introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, please feel free to get up and get coffee or uh, whatever you might want um, during this discussion. Um, just going to start off by showing this picture of the the world, um, the world as we know it. You know, with if you could stand up ten thousand feet above and the world with political boundaries. Um, you know, so it's nicely colored, and we see different countries, different sovereign. <coughs> jurisdictions. Um, some people may see the world more like this. Um, a big place that's interconnected. There are no political boundaries. The very wealthy see it this way. Some is in the light, some is in the dark. Um, it may even become shadier than that. And, uh, you know, we enter the very shady world of money laundering, terrorist financing, and usually associated with that tax evasion, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the reason this is topical, I mean, it's an issue that's always been of interest to governments and to taxpayers, but it's topical these days um, because there are uh, grand claims by governments, including the Canadian government, also international organizations like the G20 and the OECD. Um, in particular, the G20 declared in 2009 at the London summit, that the era of banking secrecy is over. Um, and there are assertions by a number of NGOs, including Oxfam, uh, Christian Aid, Tax Justice Network, and others, that the, it's far from true that the era of banking secrecy is over, um, although it may be diminished. Um, we have uh, media coverage, um, which was really going on in the UK in 2008, 2009, particularly the Guardian newspaper reporting on offshore evasion, also offshore tax avoidance. More recently, we have our own CBC um, taking people to task uh, for offshore accounts because CBC has had access to um, some of this leaked information regarding offshore accounts. Um, however, what we see is not a lot of prosecutions in Canada. People are not being prosecuted and convicted for tax evasion. So what's going on? What's the real story? Um, what are the actual legal issues? And as a lawyer, that's what I'm concerned about. There are policy issues that I also am concerned about, and I have views about that. Um, and other people have different views or similar views to me. But it's important to understand what the legal issues are so that you know, you can read the next story from CBC about so-and-so who has enormous millions offshore. Um, whether what's going on there is actually arguably legal or is it tax evasion. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I am going to avoid 
detailed references to section numbers of the Income Tax Act. As much as I enjoy doing that, I don't want to bore people to tears um, and uh, talk more about the issues in a, from a broader level. Okay, some estimates of offshore assets, so financial assets. So we're not talking about corporate movements of funds, you know, we're not talking about Google's investment in its European affiliates, we're talking about financial assets largely held by individuals, passive investment income, held in offshore financial centers or tax havens. The estimates are all over the place because people have some access to banking data but you're really just taking a stab in the dark at the amounts. And so you uh, hear estimates, I've heard 7 trillion US of offshore financial assets. Financial assets held by you know, people in the developed world in tax havens or people in the developing world held in tax havens. Uh, that 7 trillion number comes from the IMF, the Bank for International Settlements, but it's a number of year old, years old now. Um, 11 trillion uh, is another number that the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, um, suggested, but that's again a few years old now. Um, more recently people have suggested it's around US 20 trillion dollars. Um, that's a, a number that's getting quoted and requoted. It comes originally from James Henry who's a for, former chief economist with McKinsey and Co, an investment firm. And if that's correct, I mean it's far more than like the annual US GDP. I mean, it's an enormous amount of money. Um, and according to the IRS in the United States and uh, Senator Carl Levin, they claim there is lost U.S. taxes of 70 billion to 100 billion a year from what they describe as evasion and abusive tax shelters. Okay, so these numbers are the stock of money or other liquid investments held offshore allegedly. The amount of income you earn from that is what's potentially subject to tax and so their, their suggestion is the US alone is losing 70 to 100 billion a year in tax. Um, the EU tax commissioner says Europe as a whole is losing a trillion dollars a year and it, it, it wasn't quoted in euros, I mean I quoted in dollars for some reason but um, uh, anyway, US tri uh, a trillion dollars a year through tax evasion and tax avoidance. So like, like the US they're sort of grouping these two things together and saying look at all this money we're losing. Um, when the CBC last year was reporting on uh, this uh, leak of data that I'm going to say a little bit more about later in 2013, they suggested that Canada could be losing about 7 billion a year. But as far as I can tell, they simply took the US number <laughs> divided by 9 uh, as our economy is about one ninth of the US economy. Because um, I got to the same number too, but I was really just doing it that way, it wasn't really uh, <laughs> going through any sophisticated analysis. Okay, so whatever the amount is, the amount of lost taxes, if you want to call it that, it's a lot, it's a great deal of money, um, it means that governments don't have as much funding for schools, hospitals, social services, and plus it's just unfair to the compliant taxpayers who don't have the means to evade or avoid uh, and who may feel, wow, uh, this is really making me angry that those who have the most are paying so little, they're stashing their money offshore um, and may even encourage them to evade tax in their own way um, just because they're upset with the unfairness of the system. Now, in any discussion of this nature, we have to talk about the distinction between tax evasion and tax avoidance, a distinction that is not often acknowledged by the CBC and other commentators, or if it's acknowledged, it's not understood, um, as far as I can tell. So what's the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance? Um, Dennis Healy, the former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, said it is the thickness of a prison wall. So this is just a, a rather old uh, graphic of some people escaping from prison, some guards outside. And the idea of this metaphor is there is a huge difference in that 
you are in prison versus not. You are free, but it also suggests it's very close to the line. You know, it's a wall between you and what you're, the avoider is doing may be very similar to what the evader is doing, except one is illegal and one is legal. Um, in Canada, tax evasion is a criminal offense, as it is in other parts of the world. Um, I won't get into the sections of the Income Tax Act, but committing tax evasion, willfully not disclosing your income, which is what we're talking about here, can lead to fines, it can lead to imprisonment. Uh, officers and directors of a corporation can be charged for this if the corporation is evading tax. Um, if you're convicted, uh, then you have to pay the tax, plus you might have to pay a penalty, plus you could potentially go to prison. 18-month yeah, conditional sentences are not uncommon, but you don't see a lot of people going to prison for tax evasion. But tax evasion can be the roofer who doesn't report cash income from doing a job. It can also be uh, inventing deductions in the course of your business. Uh, or it can be earning investment income offshore that is subject to Canadian tax jurisdiction and not reporting it. Avoidance is different. Um, to lawyers, the term tax avoidance is a neutral term. It's neither good nor bad. I mean, tax avoidance means you have avoided paying tax. Putting money into your RRSP and getting a tax deduction is a form of tax avoidance. It's a, it's a kind that most people would say is perfectly fine. It is encouraged by the government and so you might get into a distinction of legitimate versus illegitimate, which doesn't really say anything. You've concluded, uh, uh, you've kind of reached your own conclusion with those adjectives. Um, effective versus ineffective is probably the better way to talk about it. Does your tax avoidance strategy work or does it not? And a lot of the stuff that we see being reported on, um, I'm afraid to say, there's usually some argument that what's going on is tax avoidance that is legal. You might not like that it's legal, and I might not like that it's legal, but it may turn out that it is legal, or at least that there is an argument um, that what's gone on here is an effective tax avoidance strategy rather than tax evasion. Now, in this presentation, I am not talking about um, multinational enterprises and their corporate tax reduction strategies. I've talked about that before. <laughs> I've written about it all the time for the, what seems the last five years of my life. So I'm not talking about Google and Apple and General Electric and Citibank and others who are reducing their effective tax rate in the United States to 3% and that sort of thing through various strategies. What I'm talking about is high net worth individuals putting money offshore. And I've had calls from People at CBC and McLean's and others who say, isn't it just a given that if you are putting money offshore, you are committing tax evasion? Can't I just write a story that says that is always true? And I said, well, you can write that story, but it would be wrong. Um, because there are strategies that people take advantage of that we may find morally distasteful, but that are not actually tax evasion. So let's uh, give a few examples. I've got a picture there of Al Capone. He's a famous tax evader, among other horrible things. Um, famous gangster who was eventually convicted of tax evasion in the United States. Uh, Leona Helmsley was not a very nice person either, um, who was convicted of tax evasion. So just, you know, non-disclosure of income. You know, clearly subject to the U.S. tax jurisdiction, not reported. That's tax evasion. Um, then you hear of cases of other people who had tax problems, celebrities in the United States, although sometimes that's due to mistake or uh, accounting errors. So people like Martha Stewart, Willie Nelson, Nicolas Cage, Rihanna, you know, other people who've had problems because their accountants aren't reporting their income and so on and so forth. They may be convicted of tax evasion, they may just be assessed for unpaid tax and have to pay a whole lot. And then Willie Nelson has to go on tour across the civilized world to try to raise enough money to pay his taxes. Um, now, that third person there who really shouldn't be on this picture, I apologize. Um, does anyone know who that is? The third person there? Casey Irving. Casey Irving? Yeah. So that's Casey Irving from New Brunswick, originally, um, who is sometimes criticized. He was a wealthy 
New Brunswick businessman, of course, uh, who had lots of tax battles with the Canadian government and who eventually moved to Bermuda. Um, and thereafter would come to Canada less than six months in the year in order to avoid deemed resident status. Okay, so he became a non-resident because he was tired of paying Canadian tax. Um, and there are people who lump him in, in these discussions, with the tax evaders. According to Diane Francis at the National Post, he was the ultimate tax dodger. He's mentioned at the beginning of the story about the CBC leak on offshore data as though the two things are connected. And you may feel they're connected, but as a lawyer it's important to think about the legal issues and we have a uh, country governed by the rule of law. And um, Canadian tax jurisdiction is different than United States tax jurisdiction in that we tax on a residence basis. And maybe we shouldn't, but we do. We do not tax on a citizenship basis. So a United States citizen who does what Mr. Irving did, moves abroad and still maintains their U.S. citizenship, they do not renounce. They are subject to U.S. tax jurisdiction. They are supposed to file a return. They are supposed to report their worldwide income. That is not true in Canada. We do not tax our Canadian citizens. We tax Canadian residents, uh, which is a harder term to explain, but it's not just your physical address. It's a collection of economic and social ties that uh, result in you owing tax to Canada. Um, so my point is only this, that uh, whether what someone has done amounts to tax evasion or not, and here we're talking particularly about offshore activities, depends on what the law says. Uh, so we should not only look at what people are doing and judge that, we should think about whether the law should be improved. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I went the wrong way. Okay. Um, let's say a little bit about evasion by high net worth individuals, okay? So let's stick with activities that are not legal. So as I was saying, um, Canada taxes its residents on a worldwide basis. Um, that's what most countries do. Some countries tax people only on their domestic income, but usually worldwide basis. The United States focuses on your citizenship, which is slightly different. It's one of the only countries in the world to do so. So if you're a Canadian resident, your foreign source income is part of your income, just like your domestic source income. So you're employed in Halifax, that's part of your income. You've got some investments at the local ba Royal Bank branch, that's income. You've got some investments in the Cayman Islands, that's income. You're supposed to report all of it, it's not voluntary. Um, you may get a foreign tax credit for taxes you've paid somewhere else, but you're supposed to report that income as a Canadian resident. Now, that's always been true in the Canadian income tax system, but in the olden days it was easier to get your income outside of the tax net. I mean, the 1960s through early 1990s, some people say, was the heyday of offshore tax evasion. Um, various countries would style themselves as offshore financial centers and try to attract capital from high net worth people. They'd offer low or zero taxes, uh, basically bulletproof bank secrecy. Uh, and so Switzerland, which this is a picture of Zug, Switzerland, um, is an example that people often refer to. Um, people would put money in a Swiss bank account. So if you just put money in a Swiss bank account, earned your investment returns, and did not declare the income, that was tax evasion. It still is, it was, and still is a form of tax evasion. Um, the idea being that someone who earns investment income in Canada is going to pay tax on it. If you choose to put your money in Switzerland and earn investment income, you should pay tax on that too. It's not illegal for you to put it there. You can put your capital in Switzerland because your favorite banker lives in Zurich. That's fine, but you're supposed to report the income. Okay, what if I don't just put my money in a Swiss bank account, I set up a trust in Jersey, which is pictured here, one of the Channel Islands, or the Bahamas, or pick another nice island country. Uh, I set up a trust, it has to be a common law country that uh, has this concept of a trust. Trust is different from a company, but 
essentially means the legal ownership of the property is separated from the beneficial ownership of the property. Okay, that trust has a bank account in Switzerland. Now in the old days that would have been tolerated if you had a corporation or trust in a foreign jurisdiction you say well it's not the same thing as me so its income is not taxable in Canada until that income is distributed back to me as a Canadian. It's not as easy anymore basically 1970s and 1980s we added a series added and amended a series of rules to deal with people who use foreign corporations or foreign trusts to earn essentially passive investment income and we say yes we respect the existence of that foreign trust or foreign corporation but nonetheless the income is going to be taxable here because otherwise it's just too easy for the well advised to stick their income offshore. Now um, still I would say if you look at the non-resident trust rules as they're called in Canada and the US has similar rules, so does the UK. The idea is you're not going to be able to avoid your income tax obligations on investment income just by putting it in some foreign trust. You're still going to have to pay tax. The beneficiaries in general are still going to have to pay tax on that income. But the rules were, uh, you know, there were holes in them. I mean, people, people use the term loophole. I don't know. There just were gaps. Uh, where um, you could still escape those rules. And essentially things improved or worsened if, if you're the, taking the point of view of the tax evader beginning in 1998-99. Uh, A couple of things were happening. First of all the OECD was getting very concerned about tax havens. Uh, re released a report on what they called harmful tax competition an emerging global issue and it was partly about tax competition, you know, drawing legitimate activities into your country through low taxes, but it was also about tax evasion and encouraging countries to share information. So there was kind of a momentum to get more information sharing so you couldn't just hide behind Swiss bank secrecy, for example. Um, also Canada introduced proposals to enhance our non-resident trust rules, uh, increase reporting of foreign assets at that time, they also introduced something called the Foreign Investment Entity Rules in 1999 that were never enacted, um, although they did go through a series of revisions before eventually being dropped. So information reporting was uh, getting better in the 90s and 2000s, but frankly, oh, sorry, the real source of information was the media. 2008, 2009 and later with leaks of uh, various banking data. So there are a number of examples and I'm not going to go through all of them but um, a quite significant one was in February 2008 when the Germans uh, purchased a whole bunch of information from a former bank technician at a Liechtenstein group, LGT as they're called. It's owned by the royal family of Liechtenstein. So it was information about a whole bunch of bank customers. You know, and Liechtenstein is right there next to Switzerland and Germany and is a convenient place because of extreme bank secrecy for people to have uh, hidden their information. Um, the Germans uh, prosecuted a number of people. Some people were convicted for tax evasion. The head of uh, Deutsche Post had to resign. Um, Information about that data leak also went to the US, the UK, France, Australia, Canada and other places. Um, and the uh, guy who sold the information went into hiding and uh, hasn't been heard from since 2010. Um, the, uh, subsequent to that, the Swiss bank, UBS, released a bunch of information. Uh, sorry, the bank itself didn't release information, I apologize. Um, information was pro provided to the IRS by uh, Bradley Birkenfeld, who was an American banker working for UBS, uh, about the bank facilitating tax evasion by U.S. citizens. Okay, so um, there were penalties imposed on various UBS bankers. 
And uh, the CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, made various statements that they were cracking down on unreported offshore account holders based on this Liechtenstein info and Swiss info. Okay. Um, but the biggest leak was in April 2013, March, April 2013. This is just a, a screen capture from the CBC uh, website where the International Center for Investigative Journalists in Washington, D.C. had obtained uh, it's something like two million emails and other documents, attachments and so on regarding offshore accounts, trusts, corporations in various places including the British Virgin Islands, uh, Singapore, Cook Islands, and uh, according to the CBC there were 450 Canadians identified in those documents. Okay, and the one that uh, they came forward with at the beginning was the case of Epana Merchant and Tony Merchant, um, Canadians who apparently had 1.7 million dollars in a Cook Islands trust which was invested in Bermuda. Um, now, as far as I can tell, without having seen those documents myself, from understanding what's going on there, they simply had 1.7 million dollars of capital offshore in a Cook Islands trust where they would have been the settlers and beneficiaries, so the creators of the trust as well as the beneficiaries of the trust. It takes that money and invests it through a bank in Bermuda and they're not reporting the investment returns. Okay? That is, as far as I can tell, just straight up tax evasion. They are Canadians, they are supposed to be reporting their investment income, they're not. As far as I can tell from the description and I haven't seen the documents about their file. Um, CBC has asked me to look at some of the other documents and I have done so and I'm under a confidentiality agreement and can't talk about the details but I mean having looked at some of these other things I, there's often some sort of issue that the uh, possibly justifies what's gone on and so that's why I say with the merchant file I can't say for certain there's a beeping going on there Okay, I, uh, I can't stay for certain whether what they've done is tax evasion, but it sure sounds like it, based on the description of what went on there. Um, now, the thing is, is uh, based on this 2008-2009 stuff, and also this 2013 leak, which apparently uh, all the information is now in the hands of the Canada Revenue Agency, unlike the US and Germany, we do not see people, a lot of people being prosecuted. We don't see people being prosecuted and convicted for tax evasion. So there are people like Senator Percy Down from PEI who's been quite vocal about this, saying what is going on? Is the CRA incompetent? Why is no one being uh, prosecuted? It's all talk, no action by the government. Um, apparently there have been some people prosecuted. Uh, and there have been some reassessments, although that's a civil matter and it's not something we can really read about unless it results in a court case, so we don't really know the details. Um, but apparently some people have come forward, they've either paid tax or in some cases been prosecuted, but it's still too early to really know what's going to come out of this. And uh, Part of the reason that we may not see much come out of it is because the CRA may conclude in the end, when they go through some of these files, that as horrible as it sounds that there's all this money in the Cook Islands or the British Virgin Islands, Singapore, etc., they may conclude that there actually was nothing illegal going on, especially under the law as it existed in the 1990s. Okay? And that may be why we don't see a lot of prosecutions. Not because the CRA is incompetent, but because there's no case that they can prove. Um, because what's gone on is actually not illegal, or at least arguably is not illegal. Now aside from media leaks, the US is particularly active in trying to get information on its US citizens. Okay, so uh, Canada has enacted some information sharing measures that I'm going to talk about later, but the US uh, essentially takes the nuclear bomb approach and says FATCA, as in Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, which they enacted in 2010. And um, 
basically imposes information sharing obligations on the rest of the world. Uh, obviously, governments have to sign an agreement with the U.S. to implement this. They, you know, the U.S. can't legislate for the world as much as they might like to. They have to sign agreements with other countries. But other countries are signing on to this because they really have no choice. They have to supply information about, or their banks have to supply information to the local government that then supplies it to the IRS. Um, because otherwise, uh, essentially, their banks would face a 30% withholding tax in, on money leaving the United States. So Canada has signed on to an intergovernmental agreement with the US as of February 5th um, with some exemptions for things like US citizens who hold uh, RRSPs and TFSAs. Um, but the idea is that information is going to be automatically exchanged beginning in 2015. So Canadian banks will have to gather information about US citizens, supply it to the Canada Revenue Agency, of privacy concerns and that will be supplied to the United States. The UK has done something similar for the Crown dependencies as in Guernsey, Jersey and the Isle of Man where a lot of uh, UK residents may have bank accounts. So there are things going on to make the old-fashioned form of tax evasion uh, much more difficult. Um, and so the idea that any of this data that the CBC has is going to illustrate so-and-so stuck money in a Swiss account and didn't report their income, there might be some examples of that. The merchant case seems to be a pretty egregious example of that, but um, that's really, it's sort of a quaint idea to think that a lot of people are doing that anymore. The reality, I think, is more sinister than that. It's too easy to do that. You'll be caught. Um, that's a 1960s way of doing things. I'm going to stick my money in a Swiss bank account and not report the income. If you have any, enough income, you can afford advice to do it in a more sophisticated way than that. And possibly argue that what you've done is not tax evasion, it's uh, tax avoidance. So there's a lot of confusion about what offshore tax avoidance is, but um, this is just a quote from the Swiss Life uh, brochure that I was looking at um, talking about high net worth individuals and how they should put their money into what's called private placement life insurance. And I liked their uh, description uh, that as a person of, of above average means, you probably have a lifestyle that's even more mobile than, and more international than that of your contemporaries. You may own homes in several parts of the world. Um, it, by above average means, based on the examples they give later in the document, they mean people with a net worth of $20 million or more. So <laughs> uh, apparently that's average, above average. Um, if this is the case, one of your prime concerns will be protection for yourself, your family. You need a structure that complies with the law in your country of residence, but also at the same time gives you advantages of flexibility, security, tax liability, etc. For individuals like yourself, finding a solution tailored precisely to these needs can pose a problem. And I'm sure it can. Um, so uh, there's a thriving industry of this nature, you know, wealth management, in places like Switzerland, of course, but also Luxembourg, uh, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Singapore, Hong Kong. And those countries would bristle at the tax haven label say, look, this is not the 1970s anymore. We are not interested in taking money from drug lords and arms dealers and just hiding it from the rest of the world. That is not our goal. Our goal is to offer, they would say, political stability, uh, honest regulation, a pool of multilingual financial professionals, and I'm sure they do. Um, and so a lot of the activity that goes on there may be uh, look to the outsider as highly artificial. There's several layers, corporations and trusts and so on. But depending on the law of your residence jurisdiction may be perfectly legitimate. It's unlikely in the case of U.S. citizens that you can av avoid the tax because of the U.S. Uh, uh, exercise of tax jurisdiction over its citizens. But other countries don't have rules like that. And um, there may be ways that you can have security and privacy and defer or avoid 
tax in your home jurisdiction, even though you're not committing tax evasion. So, um, some examples. This, this document is about private placement life insurance, which is a popular way to put money offshore and uh, keep it secure, keep it private, uh, although you still might have to pay tax, especially if you are a US citizen. Um, but other examples of things that you might look at and the CBC might report on, you might say, is that tax evasion or is it not? So, I've already mentioned Casey Irving moving to Bermuda. If he really becomes non-resident, he has avoided Canadian tax in perpetuity by becoming non-resident. Um, uh, becoming non-resident and earning foreign source investment income and not reporting it to Canada is not tax evasion. It is perhaps tax avoidance of the most effective kind because you left the country. The issue of course is, and the issue that the CRA would want to look at to someone else such as an Air Canada pilot who decides to emigrate and live in the Bahamas and fly in and out of Pearson every day is have you really become non-resident? Okay, So that's an issue for sure and there's a lot of case law about what it means to be resident in Canada and if you're going to become non-resident you have to you don't necessarily have to sell your house but you have to give up your residential ties. If you maintain a house in the country uh, you better not be using it as your permanent home you know your family should go with you that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of case law on what it means to become non-resident but if you really have become non-resident um, that's not tax evasion. Um, in the United States um, during the last election some criticism of Mitt Romney for saying you know he's very wealthy he's make, got millions of dollars of wealth in the Cayman Islands. Uh, that was really uh, because uh, the private, e private equity firm that he formerly worked for was based there uh, for more for financial regulation reasons, not really tax reasons. And the reason he was only paying 15% tax is because of U.S. rules that said you should only you only have to pay 15% tax on certain kinds of investment income, so-called carried interest. But actually, the reason he was paying 15% tax is entirely a matter of U.S. law that had nothing to do with the Cayman Islands. Um, and so if you're critical of that, and I am, he shouldn't be paying 15% while the average person is paying 30. That's not appropriate. But the answer is not to criticize the Cayman Islands. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. It has to do with the treatment of investment income under U.S. law, which is what needs to change. Um, but you know, tax changes in the U.S. are difficult to get through, of course. Um, coming back to Canada, I mentioned before how in the very old days you could put money in a foreign trust and you might be outside of the Canadian rules. The income from the trust might not be taxable. Through the 90s um, there was still some ability to do that and those rules have been tightened up. Um, the difference essentially is that under the old rules if you had an offshore trust and it earned some passive investment income, it, the income uh, the, sorry, the trust would be deemed to be a Canadian resident and thus its income would be taxable in Canada if the set law of the trust, as in the person who sets it up and contributes the money to it, if they were Canadian and the beneficiaries were Canadian. Under the new rules it's an either or test sort of, but although it still focuses on where the set law was. So if you have Canadian beneficiaries of a trust and the money was put in there by somebody who was never a Canadian resident, that's still not taxable. And um, without going into the details of uh, the documents that the CRA, uh, CBC um, had me look at, all I can say is that <laughs> these almost always involve offshore trusts and they almost always involve someone who has an argument that they are non-resident. Okay? So, for example, and I'm just making this up because uh, just hypothetically, Somebody is a wealthy individual, they have a home in Canada, but they also have a home in Bermuda. Okay? They declare that they are a Bermuda resident. Okay? They set up a trust in who knows where, some foreign jurisdiction, Bahamas, let's say. They set up a trust in the Bahamas, the beneficiaries of that trust are the children in Canada. Okay? 
Now, if the trust makes money and pays income to the children in Canada to be taxable to them, but as long as the trust is accruing income in the Bahamas, it's not, then the trust can subsequently make loans to the Canadians. It can make distributions of capital. So the trust relies on the legal form of different movements of money to be able to say that is not taxable income to the Canadian kids. And why is it not taxable in the first place when it's in, earned by the trust? Because the person who put the money in there is non-resident, allegedly. They are resent, a resident of Bermuda. So if it's true that the person who put the money into the trust resides in Bermuda, then uh, it's the trust itself, which is also offshore, not necessarily in Bermuda, might be in the Bahamas, is not taxable either and distributions of capital from that trust back to the Canadian beneficiaries is also not taxable. Um, and it, the logic of that is kind of like this. If uh, your family immigrated to Canada, your parents live here, but your grandmother still lives in you know, Poland, who knows where. Okay, so your grandmother is well off, she's made some money in her life, and she decides to make a gift to her grandchildren in Canada. That is not taxable under Canadian law. Gifts, inheritances, they're not taxable. We could choose to make them taxable. Um, we could have more of a US style approach to what should be taxed. We could have an estate tax. We don't. So if she decides, well, rather than make a million dollar gift to my kids, which would not be taxable, I'm going to invest a million dollars in a Cook Islands trust. And over a few years, it becomes 1.5 million. Why should that be taxable in Canada? And then the 1.5 million gets distributed to the Canadian beneficiaries. It will not be taxable to them. Now, you might not like that, and you might not like Canada's concept of income. I've been critical of it myself, but it, that's the justification for why that kind of trust would not be taxable in Canada, because it doesn't have enough of a Canadian connection. So uh, I sound like I'm uh, saying how wonderful these transactions are and they are not tax evasion and uh, the CBC should quiet down about complaining about these. But the thing that, I've, that bothers me is that um, the lawyers and accountants and bankers and the taxpayers involved may say at each step of this thing we've set up, we have an argument that we are outside, we are compliant with the Canadian rules. Okay, so we step outside the avoidance rules, the anti-avoidance rules, that would make us taxable. So their argument is, the person who put the money in the trust is non-resident, for example. The trust itself is non-resident. Um, we're within this or that exemption. And there's, at every stage, an argument, maybe tenuous, but an argument that they are compliant with the rules. But whether they're compliant or not compliant, the Canadian government can't find out because you've put it under so many layers of secrecy. So for example, um, having a bank account in Switzerland, you know, if you're just a Canadian who holds a bank account in Switzerland, the income is going to be taxable. Um, and Canada could reasonably easily find out that you have that account under current law. Okay, well what if you've got a bank account in Switzerland that has a nominee account holder, so it's not immediately obvious who the actual account holder is. The account is owned by a shell corporation in the British Virgin Islands. All the shares of that company are owned by a foundation in Panama or a trust in the Cook Islands. And I'm not even making that up, okay? This is realistic that that sort of stuff would go on. Now, you may say, as the person who devised that, it's all legitimate. You know, the... No one, none of this income is taxable, and if the CRA uh, audited this and reassessed, we would have an argument as to why the income is not taxable. You might, but if you're so sure that it would survive scrutiny, why are there so many layers to hide it from government scrutiny? Okay? It, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and so there's, there's a tendency to just assume you must be evading tax. Um, You may be doing other things too. You may be money laundering. The source of the money in the first place could be some criminal activity. Uh, you are running away from your creditors, which is a reason why you would put money in a Cook Islands trust, because essentially the Cook Islands is a, one of few jurisdictions that basically won't respect judgments from foreign courts. 
and it's essentially impossible to approve for a creditor to approve like a fraudulent preference or something like that in the Cook Islands. So you may be doing it for privacy and avoiding your creditors, uh, money laundering, but you may also have some tax evasion going on. Um, so for the Canadian government to determine whether what someone has done is effective tax avoidance or ineffective tax avoidance or actually amounts to tax evasion, they need to be able to get the information and until very recently, that was quite hard to do. And so I think it's a positive thing that uh, it's now a bit easier for us to get this information. That does not necessarily mean that the information will show that the person has done anything illegal. So what are we doing? Um, the name of the game now is exchange of information. So the OECD has something called the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information. Um, I mentioned before how earlier the OECD had done a report on harmful tax practices and they, they identified certain tax havens that they said were non-cooperative, uncooperative. That list of uncooperative jurisdictions is now dwindled to zero because everyone is reasonably cooperative. Um, there's been progress reports almost annually on how uh, countries are implementing this exchange of information standard. Um, but it was really the 2008 financial crisis and subsequent developments where we saw the information exchange really uh, become uh, more robust. The G20 London summit I mentioned before where the G20 leaders declared the era of banking secrecy is over and countries like Luxembourg, Switzerland and Austria which is not often identified as a tax haven but had quite strong banking secrecy were pressured to start exchanging information with foreign governments. Um, and so we see this phenomenon of tax information exchange agreements or TIEAs. These are not the same thing as a full tax treaty. So Canada and the United States we have a full tax treaty. Canada and the UK, lots of countries. We actually have 92 tax treaties in force. A tax information exchange agreement is a smaller international agreement. So it tends to be you know, a shorter piece where for example Canada agrees with for example Bermuda that they're going to share information between the two countries on request. So Canada started signing these things um, uh, quite aggressively in 2009, 2010. Uh, the first one was the Netherlands Antilles and then Bermuda, Cayman Islands. We now have 18 tax information exchange agreements in force with the Bahamas, Cayman Islands, Channel Islands, uh, by which I mean Jersey and Guernsey. Uh, most recent one was Liechtenstein in January 2014. Um, so you can, you know, it's not as easy to hide your money in the castle dungeon in Liechtenstein anymore. You know, the government of Canada may actually find out. Uh, and uh, we've signed four more with British Virgin Islands and others. And then there's others we are negotiating, including with the Cook Islands, who I imagine is going to hold out to the end. So we've been signing these agreements. Um, they're better than they used to be. I mean, in the old days, basically, a country like Switzerland or Austria or others would say, well, we're not going to release information to you about your own residents unless you can show that what they've done is a crime under our law, which it might not be, especially in Liechtenstein. And plus, we respect our bank's secrecy, so we're not necessarily going to penetrate that. Under the new tax information exchange agreements, you can't hide behind that. Whether it's a crime or not in the source country is not relevant and banking secrecy in the local jurisdiction is not relevant. I mean, the, Ten years ago, it wouldn't, you know, some of these countries would not have signed on to that in a million years but the pressure post-financial crisis was to sign these things. There were people who criticize, and I, I mean, I think the jury's out on whether they are effective or not. I mean, the OECD in this most recent report here, a step change in tax transparency and some more recent documents is, um, boasts about how these things have been quite effective in sharing information. Uh, there are others who are more critical um, who say um, if you look at the typical tax information exchange agreement, and this is true of all of Canada's information exchange agreements, the information exchange is upon request. It's not automatic. So with the US FATCA legislation and Canada's agreement to uh, implement that, 
Information exchange will be automatic, as in Canadian banks must gather uh, banking data for U.S. citizens, with some exceptions, and supply it to the CRA. Um, under a, our tax information exchange agreement with, for example, uh, Bermuda, the CRA would have to approach Bermuda and say, we request banking information about so-and-so. So, uh, you'd have to have some details about the identity of who you're investigating, what tax years, you know, 2012 tax year, we believe so-and-so from Toronto had an account here. Uh, what's the purpose? You're trying to, you know, determine whether they owed tax on that income in Canada and so on and so forth. So you have to already have quite a bit of information. And that's the criticism that's made of these information exchange agreements. Um, that it would be preferable to have automatic exchange. The Canada-Switzerland treaty, we have a full treaty with Switzerland, but it includes exchange of information provisions, it's been, but a little bit stronger than some of the others. It's not an automatic exchange, but it's a little bit stronger. Um, so, you know, the end result is we get some automatic exchanges of information with countries like Denmark that, you know, people are not hiding income in Denmark. It's one of the highest tax countries on earth. So, it's the tax havens where we don't have the automatic exchange, although we may now have a TIEA. Uh, what else has Canada done besides these international agreements? Um, the, uh, the budget 2013 included this uh, interesting initiative <laughs> to pay um, tipsters 15% if, uh, if their information resulted in 100 grand or more of tax being collected in respect of offshore income. And they opened this hotline, apparently. It's in effect now. As of January 2014, you can call the hotline and report on your friends who have... Uh, but it's got to be big money because it's got to be over 100 grand of tax that they would collect. So we're talking a few hundred grand of income, meaning they've got probably millions of assets uh, that are generating that kind of income. You know, if you think about a 10% return, that means to get 100 grand, you'd have to have a million stashed offshore, and then after legal fees and banking fees and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, there's this hotline. Uh, I, I don't know if it's going to result in a lot of good information. I think it'll result in a lot of funny information that's not actually true, but you know, it's, it's something. Um, I was encouraged by the budget yesterday. I mean, there's a, the st on the spending side, there's not much going on, and you know, I'm, I'm not here to talk about that. But on the tax side, they did. Uh, the government has proposed a number of changes to our international tax rules. They're closing more loopholes, as they describe it, more to do with corporate strategies of various kinds. Um, but they, they sort of reconfirmed their um, the government's uh, commitment to tax information exchange agreements and also uh, mention the signing of the agreement, the FATCA implementing, implementing agreement with the US. Um, we have enhanced the obligation on Canadian residents to report foreign assets. So even if these assets are not generating income, like you own real estate in Florida or something, and you, let's say you don't even rent it out, um, there are obligations to report that if, you, if the cost amount is over 100 grand. Um, and so, uh, there are exceptions to that, but the rules have been, I suppose you could say, strengthened to get people to report their foreign holdings. Um, and that's really just so the CRA is aware. It doesn't necessarily mean you have any tax obligation. It's only if you generate income that you do. Um, all of this information sharing or threat of information sharing has resulted in more offshore voluntary disclosures. So the OECD did a document on this, sort of comparing different countries' programs. But Canada has a voluntary disclosure program. So the idea is you come forward, you come clean. It doesn't have to be offshore. I mean, voluntary disclosure could be about anything. It could be, you know, I'm running a nightclub and I didn't declare all this cash, you know, tips and so on. Um, and now I'd like to report it. You know, that's a form of voluntary disclosure. But it could also apply to offshore income. So the idea is you come forward, you give the full facts, you agree to pay the tax, you agree to pay the interest, but you don't get penalized and you don't have to be prosecuted. 
You can't do that if you're already under investigation and about to be prosecuted, um, but there's a process. As long as that hasn't happened, you can uh, do a voluntary disclosure. So that's what we're seeing more of those, uh, and it, what the information exchange agreements do, if anything, rather than actually resulting in Canada getting the information, it creates an incentive. You know, it tells people out there, you know what, we're going to get it one way or the other, so you might as well just come forward and uh, disclose the income that you had. Although there is some evidence from a, a couple of um, EU economists who looked actually at uh, data from the um, Bank for International Settlements who actually got access to some data that shows bilateral as in flows of money between two countries um, that was uh, private but they were given access to this kind of on an aggregated basis. And they say between 2007 and 2011 with all these signing of these information exchange agreements what you see is money moving from one tax haven to another. You see the money moving from places like Switzerland and Luxembourg into places like Panama and Uruguay and Hong Kong that maybe are not so willing to share. Uh, so they argue all this has really done is push the money from one tax haven to a less compliant tax haven. I think they're being a little bit pessimistic because there have been people coming clean and making these voluntary disclosures not only in Canada. Okay, so to conclude, um, what else could Canada be doing? Well, we could be obtaining information and we're trying to. We're signing these tax information exchange agreements. Uh, they don't really have automatic exchange. We could enhance that, I suppose. Um, the OECD is actually meeting tomorrow to have a presentation on common reporting standard for automatic exchange of information in tax matters. Tomorrow at noon in Paris. I would like to go. Uh, <laughs> but I, I can't. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there's talk about this model of automatic information exchange, which I suppose would be better. Um, we could introduce legislation like FATCA in Canada, but that's not going to happen. We don't have the market power of the United States. Um, so I doubt that's going to happen. Um, maybe we don't need to if we can just re keep relying on the journalists to leak data about uh, what's going on offshore. You know, it's probably not a great strategy, but uh, we, there, that's been helpful so far. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, getting information is great, but what are you going to do with it? I mean, the CRA, obviously, you know, they're, like anyone else, limited resources. They're trying to do the best they can. Um, they should be auditing and assessing where appropriate. As in, if they determine you've set up this structure, we think your trust is actually resident in Canada, because under some recent case law, the test for where trust resides has been modified and <clears throat> is, I guess, a little more of a realistic and substantial test. So they may say your trust is resident in Canada or the person who you say contributed to the property of this trust, the example I gave earlier, the person with houses in both Canada and Bermuda who says I'm a Bermuda resident and I contributed the money to the trust. My kids are in Canada but it's not taxable because me, the person who contributed the money, I'm a non-resident. Well the CRA might want to challenge that. They might want to audit and say well you know what the facts suggest to us you're actually a resident of Canada. There's also the issue of investigating and prosecuting. So if they believe it's tax evasion, they should be prosecuting. That's more difficult because of various reasons. I mean, more likely we're going to see some audits and some assessments based on some of this information that's been leaked. Less likely we're going to see criminal investigation and prosecution because um, it's so hard to prove. I mean, they have to prove it on a criminal standard, so beyond a reasonable doubt. The person can always argue, based on my lawyer's advice and accountant's advice, we believed the structure was effective. You've concluded it's not. And maybe a tax court would conclude it's not. And uh, the income is actually taxable for various reasons, because the trust was resident in Canada, or so on and so forth. Um, but that doesn't mean tax evasion has happened. Okay, so I don't think we're going to see a lot of investigations and prosecutions. Um, the last thing is, well, uh, even if you've got all this information and you look through it and you conclude based on Canadian law there was no tax owing, if you're still unhappy about that, the answer is 
you know, you can criticize the people involved and say you should have behaved in a more morally upstanding way. We wish you would remain in Canada. We wish you would pay tax uh, at the highest marginal rate. We wish you would not engage in avoidance strategies. But if the strategies work, your answer is to rethink the tax laws. Um, how do we treat income that accrues offshore? How do we treat non-resident trusts? How do we treat other kinds of foreign investment entities? And there's been talk about that for a decade now. And um, changes have been, yes, it is sweet. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I would have, if, I, I sort of was cynical about this and I said, does the federal government actually care? Are they just signing these agreements to give the appearance that they're doing something and they actually don't want to do anything because all these wealthy folks are friends of people in the prime minister's office and so on? I'm more uh, optimistic uh, based on the last two budgets that the government is actually concerned about this. They're tightening up the non-resident trust rules. They're proposing to eliminate this five-year exemption for trusts for people who've recently immigrated to Canada, which I didn't think they would do. Um, and it suggests, you know, whatever you might think of the current federal government, it, thinks, it suggests they are concerned about maintaining some integrity of the tax system and not letting people um, have uh, capability either to evade or avoid tax on their investment income by sticking it offshore. So I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take any and all questions. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm just going to have a drink of water. Okay, yeah, any questions? Yes, at the back. Yeah, I mean, um, Art Cofield at Queens, who does tax, talks a lot about privacy, and he knows more about it than I do. And he, you know, he, he's writing a paper. I think he's concerned about the privacy implications of FATCA, because obviously it has privacy implications. Um, these banks are. I realize, like the Canadian banks, don't just gather this information and immediately hand it over to the IRS. They hand it over to the CRA, but I'm not really sure what. So there's that intermediate step, which I guess offers some protection. Um, yeah, the, um, if you think about it the other way, so Canadian residents who have some income in uh, a country that typically had great secrecy, such as Switzerland or Luxembourg or Liechtenstein, um, yeah, I mean, I think people are right to be concerned about their privacy. Um, and that's why I've said when people have, uh, you know, when people from the CBC have asked me, is, uh, is there any, why on earth would anyone ever have an account in Switzerland unless they're committing tax evasion? And I say, well, you, you know, there could be reasons. People who have a lot of wealth may just be concerned about the pr their privacy. They don't want random people intruding into their private affairs. They're still declaring their income. They're still paying their tax, possibly. That's, the, that's a, the most positive way of looking at it. Um, so there's, there's privacy concerns for sure, uh, but all of us have privacy concerns, and if our money's in Canada, you know, the banks automatically send information slips to the CRA on our earnings, on our uh, investment returns, um, and we sort of accept that, that, uh, you know, it's, we have a self-assessment system, I mean, basically, you, you know, it's up to us to voluntarily disclose our income, but we have some of those checks like um, automatic delivery of information from banks. So this is really just saying it has to happen on an international basis, you know. And yeah, it is. It is an intrusion into people's privacy, but I think I don't really know. I don't really have any views on how you balance them. I think um, uh, the, if the information is not shared, internationally, then it's just too easy for people to evade. Um, what else is the government to do when we don't have a globally harmonized system and they have to rely on exchange of information? Otherwise, they'll never have it, unless it gets leaked. Yes? Um, I have two questions. One of them is that my understanding is that been, as part of the general cutback the government, 
chats with lawyers or evaders. And I'm wondering if you have any information about that. I'm going to have a question later. Sure. Yeah. Well. Um, uh, yeah. Just I'll uh, hear the second question, then I can I can remember the first one. <laughs> uh, the second question is in terms of uh, rethinking our income tax legislation. Uh, one of the things that um, Neil Brooks has talked about is instead of saying in tax legislation that these things aren't allowed, and then lawyers trying to figure out how to get around those, mm -hmm. if you switch the method to saying these things are allowed, and this is the intent of the law and everything else that doesn't fit the intent is illegal, then that, that, that makes it much easier for judges to actually follow the intent of the law and, and makes it much less likely that lawyers will figure out a way to get around it. I'm wondering if you have anything about that in the international yeah. tax evasion kind of setup. Yeah, on the on the first question, I, I, you're right. I mean, I can't remember the numbers now, but there have definitely been cutbacks to the Canada Revenue Agency, and people have said, "Look, how are we supposed to do these two things at the same time?" You say we're going to really crack down on um, offshore evasion, and we're also going to have auditors who can really closely inspect, you know, avoidance transactions and see if there's an argument of one kind or another as to why it's not effective, and therefore more tax should be collected. Um, it's, uh, I find it strange that the government is cutting back. I mean, I realize this government's philosophy is to cut back public service generally, but I, it's surprising to me that they would be cutting back on the resources of the Canada Revenue Agency because it's, it's fairly easy for them to show uh, the return on what they do in terms of revenue raise. So I, I do find that surprising. Um, I don't know, though, the, the details of whether they felt there was... Uh, there were people who were just doing nothing or something like that, which I find uh, is unlikely. Um, and so, if anything, you know, the CRA could use more resources, not less. Um, and it should pay for itself, you know, it seemed to me. <coughs> um, on the bigger, on the other question, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I kn I've um, heard Neil say that before and I, I see what you're saying. Um, you're, I, I mean, I think you're right that uh, you know if you sort of reinvented the way we draft our tax legislation, um, then you could uh, stamp out a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, I guess I'm a bit of a pragmatist in that I, I I don't see how we're going to do that on our own and just reinvent. I mean, we've sort of inherited. Uh, legislative style, but also the common law of, of Great Britain, and we have a lot of principles that we've inherited from them that people rely on, and judges are, are very keen in tax on, on uh, certainty and predictability and so on and so forth, and um, just changing everything like that. Of course, we, the Parliament is supreme, and it could, it could, um, and I don't see us changing to some system where uh, the Income Tax Act specifically says what's allowed and everything else is not. Um, I think there's some room for us to make changes in that direction though. I, I mean, I've always felt that, I mean, I haven't spoken about the general anti-avoidance rule today, but the, the, the problem with that is the, the legislation is so detailed, so many rules on top of rules, exceptions, anti-avoidance rules, that when somebody does something that exploits a gap, and the argument the government makes is it's contrary to the purpose or policy of the legislation. It's so hard for the judge to really see what the purpose or policy is because there isn't one anymore. It's just a series of obscure rules built on top of each other, and that's unfortunate. I don't. It, it, it uh, would be better if we could at least start by having some statements of principle in the legislation, like maybe at the beginning of each sort of uh, section, group of sections about the purpose of this subsec or uh, division of the act is to do the following and. Um, I know they've tried a bit of that in the United Kingdom, and it's um, and and Australia. Um, I still think when you look at their legislation, it's not much different than ours. So I think there's some room to go in that direction, and I, d I don't know how we get there easily. That's all I can really say. Yeah, you and your thoughts on a couple of things. Uh, sure. As close as we are in the U.S., I guess it it um, it goes to your last point to the U.S. thing. So I'm wondering how you, what do you think? We'll be going along the lines of taxation based on 
citizenship as opposed to residency. I think it's just the U.S. and maybe one other country. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the U.S. Eritrea, and, I think. And, yeah, whether we'll be doing that as well. And the second question, I guess, along the lines of the U.S., whether you see uh, uh, taxes coming in respecting succession duties or estate taxes in the next generation. Yeah, um, I don't. I really doubt that we would move to taxation based on citizenship. Um, I think just taxation based on residence is, uh, again, something we inherited from the UK and is sort of ingrained in our tax system. That doesn't mean we couldn't, but we'd have to legislate it. And I, um, I just, I'm not sure that's a desirable thing. I'm not sure. I, I question why the U.S. should tax non-resident citizens on their worldwide income. Um, but that's been their approach. And I mean, when you, I mean, if you go on Twitter and search for the hashtag FATCA, it's like an endless stream of vitriol against that and saying it's the people saying the US is, uh, you know, invading our privacy. They um, think they've ruled the world. And, uh, you know, there are legitimate privacy concerns, as I already mentioned, but there's a lot of negativity about that. And, um, Tax lawyers, obviously the Republicans are critical of it, but that could just be for political gain. But I think, um, you know, there, uh, there are also a lot of tax lawyers in the U.S. who say it's just going to cost a ton of money to supply and for the IRS to gather all this info and um, it's really unnecessary. So I don't see us moving to a citizenship-based um, tax system, nor do I really think we should. Um, I do think there, uh, in terms of how we define residence and who's taxed as a resident, um, the rules on individuals and where they reside are pretty decent. Like the case law, you know, the judges have been taking a fairly substantive view and they haven't let people just make technical arguments about how they became non-resident. With corporations, it's different. I mean, with corporations and trusts, I think the, the rules about where a corporation resides are pretty artificial. Um, and that allows a lot of the corporate avoidance that I wasn't really talking about today. Um, on the, uh, sorry, remind me, the second issue, second question. With the estate tax. Estate tax, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, uh, I find the idea of an estate tax or inheritance tax attractive. A lot of the developed world does have one, but I also know the criticism of it is uh, it discourages saving. Um, it's also... In, I mean, in the UK, there's a massive amount of avoidance of that tax. It seems to me you could deal with that in certain ways. I, I mean, uh, we have a system based entirely on income, and when they revised the income tax rules in the early 70s, they got rid of the um, estate tax. So instead, we just have this, you know, there's a tax on any capital gain when you die, you know, and the value, value that your uh, property has, has risen, except your principal residence. Um, I do wonder, though, if we would benefit from an estate tax uh, for various reasons. Um, I, I really do think it increases the progressivity of the system because the income tax system we have is progressive to a point. You know, and the idea is as you make more, you move up into a higher tax bracket and pay more. But when you look at the effective rates that people are paying, it rises until you make about $150,000 a year and then it levels off and it starts to go down. And the people who've got the million dollars net worth and who are earning a few hundred thousand a year have a lower effective tax rate in many cases than the uh, middle class. So one way to deal with that is to have an estate tax with a big exemption like they do in the U.S. or the U.K. You know, where you know, the first million dollars is exempt or something like that. So most people are just completely outside of it. But those who have uh, more have some small tax in their estate when... Uh, wealth is transferred. In places like Germany, it's just accepted. Like, you have to have a tax like that, but we seem to be pretty opposed to it. This idea that it's uh, double tax, discourages saving, that sort of stuff, encourages people to spend all their money during life. Um, so there may be something to that. The thing is, if you're going to have an estate tax, uh, it's, it's got to be federal. Like, it's got to be Canada. You cannot have a Nova Scotia estate tax. I mean, it just wouldn't work. I mean, People would move to another province. The very wealthy would definitely move to another province to avoid that. I think it would have to be a federal tax. So we you know, obviously would need a change of federal government if we're ever going to talk about an estate tax. Um, so I could see it happening. You know, I, I, 
I, I mean, there are people, economists and lawyers from both sides of the political spectrum who I've seen argue for it. So I, I think it's possible in the generation that we could reinstate that. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, yes, yeah, Stephanie. Um, so in regards to FATCA, um, I haven't read the agreement we've come up with yet. Was there any pressure by the Canadian government to make it more of a bilateral agreement, or was there a lack of market power? Who were just scripting on that? Um, Yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, the, the Canadian government seems to be um, sort of uh, highlighting the fact that we were able to get some of these exemptions for tax deferred accounts or tax, you know, so our, our RSPs, our DSPs, our ESPs, TFSAs. So, um, uh, so um, things that, you know, you don't have to pay tax on on a current basis in Canada, but you might have to in the U.S. if you're a U.S. citizen who has such things. Um, so. Your tax obligation might still be there, but the obligation to provide the information um, upon Canadian banks is not there. So that's good. It's good. I mean, that's the sort of victory for the Canadians. Um, I mean, we're not the only country that signed on to that, and I guess uh, it, is, it is an issue of the market power that the U.S. has, and we'll see how that changes. Um, we already have information exchange with the U.S. Uh, under our treaty, uh, but not at the level that FATCA requires. And I guess, you know, um, we're content to rely on our domestic tax rules to so say if you're a Canadian resident and you happen to have some U.S. accounts, you know, you should be reporting the income. We're not worried about Canadian citizens who reside in the U.S. and have U.S. accounts because we don't tax them. Uh, whereas the U.S. is concerned about that the other way around. So, yeah, it's hard to know. Um, you know, the, uh, I don't think, you know, there's not a lot of transparency about what went on in those negotiations. The same as with all of our tax treaties. There's virtually no, you don't, unless you were there or you speak to somebody who was there, it's hard to know, like, why did we agree to this article in our treaty? Like, it's sort of all in a black box. Um, and so you can only sort of hypothesize. So... So yeah, I don't know. I, I think it is an issue of market power and maybe, maybe we just don't care because we don't want that information. <laughs> on a, we don't want this annual massive dump of info from all the U.S. Uh, banks. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, sorry, you have a fault? Yeah, yeah. Um, Canada has said that they want to come back. Yeah, come back? Yeah. yeah, okay, I think I saw a hand over. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you were saying that uh, when you talk about the three sets of leaks, that the Germans had a number of prosecutions quite quickly, and then you were talking yeah. generally about prosecutions in Canada, and you thought it was very unlikely because people would, you know, they could argue that their their arrangement was effective. What's the difference between the German law and our law, and is there anything we can mention that? Yeah, um, I don't know a lot of details of the German law other than. Um, uh, Other than to say very broadly, you know, obviously being in Europe, it's a more European model, and they t uh, it um, ours is a British Commonwealth model, and although the UK is part of Europe, you know, it's uh, different legally, um, and so um, Germany, like France and other parts of um, continental Europe. This, the system is just different. The tax rules are different, um, and um, the uh, ability of a German resident to uh, earn income through a trust in a foreign jurisdiction and claim that it's not taxable under German law, without knowing the details, I'd say that, that it's just not very likely that they could make that argument, whereas successfully, whereas in Canada there's still the ability to make that argument if you can fit into particular exceptions. So it's a, it's a different legal history, a different legal tradition, and um, without, I mean, I know that's very vague, I'm not giving a lot of details, but uh, if you look at who's prosecuting people, it's Germany, if some in France, and the United States, you don't see it in the UK, and you don't see it in Canada. And 
the UK and Canada are comparable in that respect. You might see a lot of criticism in the media, more so over there, of um, not only corporate activity, but also like Starbucks doesn't pay a lot of tax in the UK, but also high net worth people, celebrities and so on, who have, uh, you know, entered some pretty aggressive structures offshore that they maintain are legal. Now those people are not charged with tax evasion. They may be pressured by public pressure to actually stop doing what they're doing and bring the money back to Canada. So we're like the UK in that, you know, people seem to, if they're well advised, it's not like you can always avoid your tax, but there may be ways, if you're wealthy and you have international relations, there may be ways that you can have trusts offshore that are not taxable. Same in the UK. Um, what the UK has and what we don't have is, uh, a more, I guess, uh, more of an attack-oriented media that's actually going to make people account for this and you know, actually come forward and say, well, what I've done is legal, but I shouldn't be doing it, and I'm going to stop doing it. And in Canada, I just find we are uh, too conciliatory. You know, we're pacifists. You know, and we don't want to bring, uh, don't want to shame people for doing these things. And so, um, when you, I mean, the CBC stories about various people. You know, Jim Love, the chairman of the Mint, and other people who've been involved in some of these things. You read the comments afterwards, and I, you know, and there's a lot of commentary. You know, this random comments people just criticize the government vaguely, but then there's people who say, there's quite a bit of people who say, why are you criticizing this person for taking advantage of international tax rules that allow them to put income offshore? It's completely legal, and they almost seem to think it's morally virtuous. You know, that they're. I think it's not. Whether tax avoidance is morally virtuous or not is, I think, an open question. I think there are, there, there are a lot of difference of opinion on that. Um, so we don't seem to have the same. I'm actually surprised, because I would have said the same in the UK, except that they have been quite vocal in attacking some of these high net worth people putting money offshore. But like the UK, there seems to be a lot of scope to argue that what you've done is um, not tax evasion. Um, just mention very briefly, there's a, a case that you might want to look at called Antle, A-N-T-L-E, uh, that involved people setting up a Barbados trust to have a, a Barbados spousal trust that produced a capital gain, which was allegedly only taxable in Barbados. The money eventually found its way back to Canada. And there's sort of step-by-step -step detailed structure to make sure that was not taxable in Canada. And it, the CRA... Uh, brought a reassessment and said, we think that's actually taxable for a number of reasons. And the court, the tax court, concluded that the trust was a sham. So the trust was not actually a trust because it lacked the requirements of the common law of a trust. So basically, you didn't really intend to have a trust. It was all just run from Canada by the people who owned the property. And so the trust was a sham. Now, that means you had to pay tax on the capital gain end of judgment. There is no subsequent allegation that the people were involved in tax evasion, that the lawyers were unethical in advising on that transaction, nothing. It's just, it was a sham, therefore you owe the tax. Uh, and that would be the same, I think, in the United Kingdom, very different from German and U.S. approach. You, did you remember? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, just based on like, the complexity of the Income Tax Act and the advanced tax planning, these people are able to undertake Um, yeah, I mean, I think the fact that you, uh, I, w I mean, I wouldn't say that um, the problem is that the judges can't understand it in the, in the provincial courts where you would bring a criminal. I think they could, but um, I think the, the CRA and Department of Justice looking at something like this, they, the, I mean, the, the CRA has to make an early determination, like, are we going to audit? Are we going to investigate? Because if they're using their audit powers, which are broad, to get information, they're actually using it in the course of a criminal investigation, and there's charter violations, and all the information will be, um, you know, they won't be able to use it. So it's, um, I mean, obviously something can transform from an audit to an investigation, because you, you're auditing, you realize, oh, wait, I think there's some criminal activity going on here. But then the, it has to be hand it over to the people who are going to do an investigation and then they've got to decide, you know, can they, 
prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, which you know, I've, I've, I've asked that question, I mean, I was at a conference and talked to a person from the CRA, saying, you know, why, it was a couple of years ago, why are we not seeing people being prosecuted? And he said to me, you know, it's just, it's really, really challenging, A, to get the information to prove what happened, but even we, if we, once we've got the information, to prove that the people involved had the mental element, you know, the mens rea, the criminal intent to defraud is really hard for us to prove because they will say all along, the rules are complicated, my understanding from my lawyer's advice was that uh, what I was doing was a sophisticated tax avoidance strategy, not tax evasion, so it's, and I think at some, you know, obviously at some point that could amount to the person being willfully blind, and yes, they, they could prove a case of evasion, but it's rare. And so when you look through the CRA website, who's being convicted of tax evasion, it's, you know, the waitress who didn't declare her tips, the roofer who didn't declare his roofing income, it's, you know, small businesses who d just completely invented deductions or didn't report the receipts. It's not, it's not millionaires with uh, money in Switzerland. I see we're just about at 8.30, so I should probably let people go, and if there are any other questions, I'm happy to stay after. So thanks a lot for coming out so I didn't have to talk to myself.